Türkiye'nin ekonomi televizyonu Ekotürk'ten herkese merhaba. Bugün yine özel röportajımızla karşınızdayız. Bugünkü konuğumuz CNBC'nin baş ekonomisti Steve Leisman bizlerle beraber olacak. Kendisine merhaba dedikten sonra ilk sorumu yöneltiyorum. Uh, welcome Mr. Leisman. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. I would like to start asking the coronavirus and its effect to the USA economy. Can you please give some uh, details about how um, it's shaped like what the situation right now? <clears throat> it's been a pretty devastating economic effect here in the United States. Uh, the unemployment rate is surging uh, up near 15% and people think the real unemployment rate is near 20%. There's an expectation uh, in this quarter that we're going to have something like a 35% decline in GDP on an annualized basis. So it'll be 11% uh, quarter to quarter, but then we annualize here. Uh, and, and that ultimately we're expecting right now a rebound in the third quarter. But for the year 2020, the expectation is that we'll be down probably 6% compared to 2020, uh, 2019. So this is going to be one of the sharper declines in uh, economic output, one of the fastest rises or the actual fastest rise in unemployment we've ever seen. Uh, and I don't know if we're going to rival the uh, unemployment rate of the Great Depression, but it could be close. Okay, I mean, Fed explained a uh, $2 trillion relief package in March, and also House um, passes $2 trillion <coughs> for a relief bill. Um, do you think it's a enough uh, amount for USA economy to recover? It's very hard to say that something with the two in front of it and a trillion after it is not enough, but it may not be. It may be that the amount of uh, money already uh, passed by Congress uh, could be enough to help us through this quarter, uh, but it may be that more is needed to be done in the next quarter. Uh, this $3 trillion bill passed by the House is probably not going to become law. As you know, the Democrats um, uh, dominate the House and that the Republicans dominate the Senate. And the Republicans seem a little less willing to do additional aid. Uh, certainly, there's some more aid that has not yet been spent. There's more lending that can come from the Federal Reserve. Uh, and, and there's more that can be committed from Treasury to the Federal Reserve that might help us um, uh, provide additional lending to businesses uh, and help support the economy. But there is a feeling on the part of the Fed, on the part of other economists, that uh, for the next quarter, uh, in order to help the economy get out of uh, the downturn that it's in right now, that additional relief will be needed. Okay. Um, unemployment rate is the highest since the Great Depression, and the Powell forecast that USA economy could easily contract from 20 to 30 percent this quarter, and uh, the general decline in income associated with a significant economic failure, and um, and the companies cannot fulfill their obligation. What's your opinion about that? Well, I mean, I think what we have is two things happening in the economy right now. And often you don't have both of these things happening. You have a supply shock on the one hand and a demand shock on the other hand. So <clears throat> going through these, people have lost their jobs, they've lost their income, they've lost their ability to buy things. But not only that, they're staying at home uh, and they're not going out to their businesses. So they're not spending money. We hear people say, look, I put a couple hundred dollars in my pocket uh, two months ago. And I haven't needed that cash at all because I'm not on the way to work where I might go buy some coffee or buy a, a roll or a donut for breakfast. Um, I'm not on the street. I'm not going to a movie theater. I have no need to cash out of my pocket. So that's the demand side decline. On the other side, you have a supply side uh, crisis really going on. And it begins, for example, in China where um, uh, China shut down and we get a lot of our inputs and a lot of our products from China. So the result there was that we couldn't get certain things. Here in the United States, people are not going to work producing the things that people would buy. So you have a decline on both the supply side and the demand side, and both of those are what will come together in the second quarter. Now, we're starting to see some reopening here just a little bit. So you might get some increase on the demand side, um, and you're starting to see a little reopening, so you might get an increase on the supply side. So we'll have some bounce back, but it's going to be limited, I think, to start with. What's your, what's your opinion about the solution then for the unemployment? How can you, how do you say government reduce that unemployment rate? 
I don't think there's much the U.S. can do right now to reduce the unemployment rate. One way to think about the unemployment rate is we told people to stay home, and it's really an investment in public health. And so the idea was that what we're doing is we're, 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 we're reaping the cost of unemployment as the game being not spread virus. So um, on the one hand, we, we have provided additional unemployment benefits like we never have before. Some people are making more by staying home than they would be going to work. And there's been some concern about that, that it may be hard to restart the economy because of that. Um, but on the other hand, you don't want to do too much to get people back to work too quickly because one of the worst possible economic outcomes, I think, here would be a second wave of the virus. Um, I mean, uh, like some analysts say that this unemployment rate in USA will uh, increase because there is a like technology is growing and artificial intelligence is on the way. Um, do you think this uh, technology can help uh, to reduce the unemployment rate in USA? So that's a good question. And one thing we see in downturns a lot is whatever the trend was before the downturn, the economic recession tends to make it go faster. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, we were doing more online shopping and retail shops and stores were because of that. And now you have this coronavirus and everybody to the extent they're doing any shopping at all is doing it online. So it's accelerated that trend. You have a trend acceleration towards technology, in some cases, replacing workers. Um, I, I think that that can help in some cases because it creates new opportunities, new industries. On the other hand, you may have an accelerated trend of people might be working more from home, using technology to work from home. Uh, but also, you might have an acceleration where companies decide to make more investment in technology rather than in labor. Okay, um, we know that the unemployment rate is high since Great Depression and also it doesn't uh, affect the USA economy, it affects the whole uh, global economy. How do you think the global e economy will be shaped after the coronavirus? Um, it's another good question. Uh, if you remember into the virus, there was a lot of concern about global trade. The US and China were uh, having a, a trip. Um, and I think one of the things that will happen, well, first of all, the United States being in a recession is going to hurt everybody, just as everybody being in recession hurts the United States. Uh, and Turkey obviously is going to feel that pain uh, as well, uh, more specifically in its own region, but also from what's happening globally. Um, I think there was a trend against globalization to this. And again, I think the downturn would tend to exacerbate or speed up that trend where the result will be, for example, uh, there's a lot of talk in the United States about bringing home additional uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing. We found that a lot of the drugs that we rely upon, we get the raw materials or even the finished product from China. So now there's talk about uh, uh, manufacturing more vehicles here. There's talk about the personal protective equipment, the masks and things like that that we'll make more of that here. So that will be another sort of anti-globalization trend. Uh, that's what's happening right now is a lot of uh, leaders uh, in, in the United States, including in, in other countries as well, um, decide more on a nationalistic approach to their economies rather than a global approach. Okay, when we talk about the China and USA trade war, uh, let's keep in that line. Okay, I think it's going to a new dimension with China how do you think the trade will a trade war will be shaped after? Uh, it's another it's another good question. Um, I I think that we had come to some form of a truce in the China U.S. trade war, um, but I think now there's a political issue where uh, the Trump administration is blaming China for what's happened here with the coronavirus, um, and that is going to mean I think already a renewed round of tensions between China and the U.S. Whether or not that includes additional tensions when it comes to trade, well, it's almost certainly likely that it will. So I think what's going to happen is we might have another flare up in the U.S. China war as the administration has decided that uh, China's actions is a big reason or a big part of why the United States has a bad uh, coronavirus problem as it does. Can we actually say that um, the trade war between China and USA is a soft Cold War? 
I mean, I think so. I I think not about it. I'd say that um, uh, there are major issues as to the role of China in the global world, the global economy, the global political structures. And how to fit that in is an issue that the world has not decided yet. Uh, China represents an enormous business opportunity for all countries around the world. It has a massive middle class. It has uh, it, it is a tremendous supplier of products uh, all over the, uh, the spectrum of industries. Um, it's a tremendous um, uh, consumer of commodities all around the, uh, from all over the world. Um, it has tremendous money. It has tremendous power. Um, and it, it's really an unclear question as to how to work that into the global system that had been dominated by the United States and before that by the tension between the United States and the Soviet Union. So we're definitely in a new era here and understanding and figuring out how that fits in. The prior U.S. administrations had taken a softer line, thinking that we have issues here and opportunities over there, and we'll let them all work together. Trump administration has taken more of a hard line, uh, trying to really confront China uh, head on and trying to uh, uh, deal with the issue in a much more um, uh, combative way. Like before the coronavirus, we knew that there was a trade war like between China and USA, and what the tension was high. And there's also tension between USA and European Union, like European countries. How do you evaluate this? So the US-European conflict was a little less uh, heightened than the one between the US and China. There were issues there, there were still issues. Um, look, this administration here is one that is dominated by uh, people who really uh, are, are ideologically against global trade. I, I don't personally think they understand all the ramifications of what they're talking about. I also think they don't understand how the United States has benefited from global trade. Um, it's an easy, uh, really uh, way to demagogue and, and to be populist about the negative aspects of global trade. And there are some, but I think there's also a lot of positive aspects. And so, uh, really, it, it's an interesting question you ask because while the China-U.S. trade war came down a little bit in terms of its uh, um, uh, level of, of tension, there was renewed concern that now it was going to shift to the U.S. and Europe. I think that's on hold right now, but we'll see if that rekindles and becomes another issue. United Kingdom just exited from the uh, European Union. <clears throat> what? Like which country will be more affected from uh, from this crisis, from global crisis in European Union? Um, I, I, my feeling is nobody wins on that. I, I think that uh, my, my general feeling is that co countries benefit tremendously from global trade and that they have to take care of the people who are hurt by it in their countries in different ways, but that ultimately uh, overall people benefit. Um, I think the United Kingdom is going to suffer from this, and I think Europe's going to suffer from not having the United Kingdom as part of it. It's uh, too bad they couldn't work those issues out. Uh, let's go back to the Asian countries then. Um, like some analysts say that China will be the winner of this uh, pandemic, of this wire, uh, of this um, crisis. What's your opinion about this? How Asian countries will uh, survive or do you think they will be the winner? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't see think of this in terms of winners uh, or, or losers. I think that uh, China is going to suffer on the, in the international stage for the way it acted relative to releasing information. Um, I don't think it's going to be a winner in that regard. Um, I think that South Korea looks like it did very well in terms of how it uh, handled this issue. So if you're looking for winners, that's the one that I would uh, put forward. I think Japan did, well, did, did very well also. Um, and I think that there would be a winner in terms of saving lives and keeping infection rates down. Um, in terms of economics, China is uh, uh, went down pretty hard uh, and it's coming back slowly. So I don't think it's a winner in that regard. Um, I think we'll have to look at how growth rates respond and see who can bring their country back the fastest uh, to find the economic winners there. Politically, I don't think China is a winner because I think its international reputation suffered because of this. Okay, um, the other question is going to be about oil. The oil crisis puts the entire USA economy at risk. What's your evaluation about this? 
So there's been a very interesting evolution of oil in the United States where we became the world's largest producer. Um, and I think now we're going to experience the uh, downside of that with this tremendous decline in oil prices. And I think that's going to mean a, a, a longer lasting impact from the coronavirus uh, on the United States, because I think that there are pretty substantial parts of the U.S. oil industry that are going to have to shut down and perhaps shut down permanently uh, because the oil price is just not high enough to justify it. So I think we're going to have a series of bankruptcies. I think we're going to have a series of uh, of well shut in. And I think we're going to have a lot of mergers and, and uh, acquisitions because of it. Um, but the fortunate thing for the United States economy in that regard is um, oil became a big part of it. It was a big part of the growth of the U.S. economy. But the U.S. economy is fairly dynamic and then there are a lot of things going on in the U.S. economy. There's manufacturing and there's the service sector. Um, there's home construction. And so we're going to take a hit on the oil part, but I don't think that hit is going to be the most important thing that happened to the U.S. economy. It's something we're going to have to adapt to over the next couple, three years, I would say. But um, uh, over time, there are other parts of the that do, what we do, will do well because oil prices are low. Consumers will benefit. That'll create some extra spending power. Uh, some of the, business, the businesses that use energy uh, will do better. They'll have higher profits. So I think the dynamism of the U.S. economy uh, will ultimately prevail in terms of the uh, impact of, of lower oil prices. I mean, the crisis is affecting many countries, and I think it will affect the, the Trump's election in November. That's my opinion. What's your opinion? Well, yes, the uh, coronavirus is going to be a major political issue. Uh, and the question as to whether or not the Trump administration handled it well is going to be discussed, whether or not outcomes could have been better, whether or not more people were die uh, more people died or were hospitalized or were infected than otherwise could have been. Um, but it's not a slam dunk negative against the president in the sense that, well, first, the, uh, uh, the challenge Biden has to make a case that he would have done better. Um, and the uh, issue of whether or not the economy was shut down for too long or not long enough, that's going to be a major question when come, come election time in November. And that, answer, that question hasn't been answered yet. Um, we will see. If we reopen this economy and it goes well and there's not another round of infections, then I think that'll be very helpful to the president. If there's another round of infections and we have to shut down again, then I think uh, that's going to be uh, damage he may not overcome. Okay, my last question will be um, the usage of dollar in the global economy, it's um, 60 percent. And do you think um, if, if the usage of, usage of dollar in the future uh, get less, it will affect the USA? I, I, I don't see that the U.S. dollar as the sort of global currency is challenged from any place that is meaningful right now. Um, we've gone through a couple waves of challenges. Uh, there was a time when people thought when the Euro was launched that perhaps it could rise to be a challenge to the, being the reserve currency of the world. Um, you see what happened with Brexit and with the European Union in general. And so I think the Euro failed that test. There was also a time when there was concern or, 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 or um, speculation that the Chinese yuan could potentially be a reserve currency. But China has failed that test as well. Um, and so when you think about whether or not the United States dollar remains the world's reserve currency, think about what the alternative can be. There's been talk about the IMF uh, special drawing rights being the uh, uh, reserve currency, but that doesn't really have much support and doesn't seem to really work very well. So I, I don't see a challenge to the dollar as the reserve currency. As to the level of the dollar and its strength or weakness, um, certainly a weaker dollar is something the administration would want. And, and it has made efforts to try to weaken the dollar. It doesn't really work very well. Um, every time something happens bad in the world, people buy dollars. The dollar strengthens. Even when something bad happens in America, people buy dollars. That's just the re reality of what the reserve currency means, is that at a time of panic or crisis, you go to the risk-free currency, and that is more and more and remains 
the dollar. So I don't see a whole lot of change in that happening. Okay, I will pass to the Turkish economy a little bit, the Turkish economy with USA economy. Um, do you think the activation of S-400 uh, in Turkey could affect the USA and Turkish relations in economic-wise or in political-wise? I think it's an issue. Um, I've, I've read a bit about this. It's obviously not my area of expertise. Um, th the question becomes, and I can't answer this, how the administration wants to handle this particular issue. Either A, as a preeminent issue that is one that would cause us to uh, escalate it further in our relations with Turkey, or as one of a series of, as I was talking about before, there are problems and there are opportunities. If they, if they have a context of a working relationship, you could see this issue uh, being put into that context. But it is possible that the S-400 issue becomes one that is elevated to uh, being, being preeminent and could cause more lasting tension or damage to the U.S.-Turkish relationship. Bugünkü programımızın sonuna geldik. Haftaya görüşmek üzere. Hoşçakalın.